scripture reading this morning will be from Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men, the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and application of thanksgiving, let your quests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. everyone here. I've enjoyed just a little bit of time this morning we've gotten to spend together singing praises to God and praying to God, and now we get to hear God speak to us through His Word. Now, I have a little bit of an apology right off the bat. Uh, I think it was two Wednesdays ago, I said that on Sunday I was going to announce kind of the results of the uh, elder nominations that the men have, have met and considered those things, um, and that I, I forgot on that Sunday. I had everything written out, and I got into the pulpit, I didn't have it with me, so I apologize. That was my fault. Um, so this is uh, kind of the conclusion of that of that time. Uh, the men decided that we would have at least, or we're looking for at least three elders, so that there are not only, you know, a tie, um, you know, if it came to that, that we would have three or more. We looked at the, the men that were nominated, and, and Art and I um, spoke with them, and so we determined that there were uh, some who did not desire the position or the work of an elder. That was something that we considered in our series of lessons, that it's a work that needs to be desired. It's not something someone should be forced into. Um, there were some who um, were not qualified. There's also some who desire the work, but maybe there are some areas that they needed to grow in, and so they have resolved that they want to uh, work and grow in those areas. Um, so we have two things moving forward since we do not have an eldership established at this moment. Number one, there is a challenge to all of the men. There are those who are of an age who could become an elder. Um, the challenge for all of us is to live in such a way that we can fulfill that pattern for God. It is God's desire that His church have elders, and we need to strive for that pattern until we reach it. Uh, the next challenge is for the congregation. Uh, the men have decided that we will review this again in one year. And my understanding is that we will continue to review this until we have in pattern God's uh, you know, God's pattern for the church. So, for the congregation in this upcoming year, we should keep our eyes out for the men who desire the position, and not only encourage them, but also to look and see how they are serving the congregation. So that when we meet, uh, when we go over this again in a year, we will um, be looking for those things. And so we will continue this until uh, we fulfill God's pattern. And so. The sermon this morning I've entitled Seeking Peace in the Storm. And so, is anyone stressed this morning about what's going on in the world? Like, does any of it seem stressful? I mean, I'm not a person who really dwells in the news. I've just been hearing about things. And I've been hearing about people, even in high places, that are well off and rich, and they're saying, I'm scared for what's going on in the world. And so, there's a lot to be anxious about. So, I was looking on news websites, I tried to pull some of the headlines over. Just some of the things that are not only going on in our world currently, but then specifically in the past week. So we're looking at some of these. Number one, there's a war in the Middle East. A lot of people are talking about it. A lot of people are stressed out about what's going on. Here's a, a you know, getting live updates pretty much on the hour of what's going on over there. Israel says ground operations are expanding in Gaza as war with Hamas rages. Not only that, you may or may not be aware that there was a uh, massacre in Maine with a gunman that was and I'm not sure how many people perished because of that, but that was something that a lot of people were following over the last couple of days. Main shooting, again, live updates on the hour. Suspect is dead after massive multi-day manhunt. You might be considering, you know, the safety of your own family. What happens if this were to occur in Iowa? The most come over from Chicago or something like that. Scary. Not only that, a lot of people are concerned about the upcoming election. You may or may not realize next year's a, a election year, and they're already talking about it. Kind of like when you walk into the stores, they already have Christmas decorations, and you're like, why? With the election? 
People are already talking about the election. It's not. It's still a year out. A lot of people are stressed about that. A lot of people are thinking, we can't do another four years under this administration. What is going on in the world? And to top all of that, we also have to talk of food shortage. And so all the things going on and, and not having enough food and the price of food going up. And so all of this combined can put us in a stressful position. A position where we are worried and we are anxious about what is going to happen next month year? Where is the world going to be in two years? We don't know. How am I, as a Christian, supposed to handle all of these current events? How am I supposed to look at that? What am I supposed to do? And Paul gives us very simple instructions. So we're only going to be reviewing two of the verses from the context that Brad read this morning. He said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. If we were to break apart these two verses, there's very simply a negative command. There is something that we are not to do. There is a positive command. There is something that we are supposed to do. And when we follow the negative command and the positive command, there is something that God will do for us. And when we do that, it will result in and who here this morning doesn't want peace? I think we all desire it. So let's see what God's Word has to say about how we achieve this. And so as I told people, I have I have searched through this PowerPoint multiple times. There's nothing misspelled. So I did have a challenge that I said I'd pay a dollar to anyone who found a misspelled word. This one should be good, so I think we'll be able to keep those dollars. The very first point that we're going to cover this morning comes from verse number 6. This is the do not do this. It says, be anxious for nothing. So this morning, are you worrying? Are you anxious about tomorrow? Stop it. It's that simple. That is the negative command. And so, let's go over to Matthew 6 and verse 34, what Christ said as he was speaking on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own thing, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So I was looking at various quotes online about worrying. There's one that stuck out to me. It says, Worrying does not take away tomorrow's troubles. It takes away today's peace. It robs us of the peace and the joy God would have us to have as Christians through Christ. So he commands us to stop worrying. And I want to take just a moment and think about that. This is a command from God. If I am worrying and anxious, I am disobeying a command of God. And so that's why we need to be very wary. But what kind of thing should I stop being anxious about? What do I need to stop worrying about? Let's go back to that word for anxious. If we look at Thayer's Dictionary, it says it means to be troubled with care. If we go to Vines, it says to be anxious about or to have a distracting care. Something that pulls our attention away from whatever the main point of your life is. Now, let's consider us as Christians. What can it distract us from when we're worrying about tomorrow? What well, distracts us from our number one goal as Christians? Our number one goal needs to be, I want to get myself to heaven. I want to spend eternity with the God of the universe. And I want to get as many people there as possible. My family, my church family, anyone I can come in contact with. That's goal number one. And when we are anxious, it can leak away what we're supposed to be focusing upon. One verse earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Christ said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I can be so anxious about the what if of tomorrow that I'm not serving God today because I'm so frozen in peril and peril about what is going to occur. Now let's think about the context. In the context of the book of Philippians, Paul had a very close relationship with the Philippian brethren. He loved them very much. Of course, he loved the whole church, but especially those in Philippi. They had a special place in his heart. And the people in Philippi were very anxious because of what Paul was going through. And so he's wanting to put their mind at ease. If we go back to chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul says, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Don't worry. The things that you may have heard that's going on with me in prison and all the afflictions that I'm going through, don't worry. Because the gospel is being spread. 
And if you're someone who's been worrying about Paul, to hear those words from Paul himself, it should put you at ease, realizing, okay, he's okay. And it turns out the context is not just that Paul was going through a little bit of difficulty, but the difficulty he was going through might take his very life. And so that's really the tone of chapter 1, which leads to a verse we're probably very familiar with. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's very possible that the persecutions he was enduring could possibly lead to his death. And if you had a child or a loved one who was in prison and in danger of dying, would you be anxious? If you had a family member who was over in Israel right now and they were sitting in a prison and you didn't know how long they were going to live, would you be anxious? The people were anxious for their brother in Christ, for Paul. And he's putting their mind at ease. And so he's saying, don't worry. Focus on Christ. Because I, Paul, that's what I'm doing. I'm focusing upon the gospel. And so I hope that this is this point has stressed the fact that we should not worry or be anxious. It is the negative command of this verse. But how do we stop? What do I need to do? So Paul continues and says, don't do that, but rather do this. Replace that negative command. Rather than worrying and being anxious, rather do this. Continues on and says, but in everything by prayer and our address to God and supplication, which means asking Him with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul tells them, rather than worrying and being anxious, you bring all of that in prayer to God. Our prayers should be as comprehensive as our anxiety. There's not one thing that your Heavenly Father does not want you to hear about from you if you are anxious about it. Now, I think about the husband and wife relationship. If there's something that Georgie is worrying about, even if it's considered a, a small thing, I want to know about it. I want to help her. Our Heavenly Father says, whatever it is that you're anxious about, bring it to me. Don't worry. So what are some of the things you might be worried about? Are you worried about your finances? Are you worried about your relationship? Are you worried about your health? Are you worried about the state of the world? Are you worried about your own personal safety or the safety of your family? Whatever it is that you are worried about, God wants to hear. And you're not bothering him. So he says, bring it to me. So as you're thinking about that, you might ask the question, doesn't God already know what I need? Doesn't God already know what I'm going through? Let's go over to Matthew chapter 6. Christ says, For your Father knows the things that you need before you even ask Him. Yes, He knows. But He wants you to ask Him. Why? Why does God want you to bring what He already knows to Him? Something we considered in, in class this morning. It's not to boost His ego. It's for our good. Because something beautiful happens when I acknowledge my anxiety to God. A beautiful thing is that it's a natural occurrence happens. So let's consider what that means. I don't want us to think that God is minimizing our problems by saying, stop your anxiety. He's not saying what you're worried about doesn't matter. And some of the things I put up on the screen, those are major anxieties. Those are big worries. He's not minimizing them. But rather, when we give our problems to God, our problems are minimized. And let's think about that for just a moment. So, how many of you here know who Shaquille O'Neal is? You ever heard of that guy? A very big basketball player. I think he was, I'm going to show my lack of basketball knowledge. I think he was popular in the 90s, probably early 2000s. Now he does, uh, I think I saw him at like Office Depot the other day. He's holding a printer. So he has a lot of business deals. Anyway, Shaquille O'Neal. I've compiled a, a number of different uh, pictures. There's kind of some funny things online uh, that people show about him. Because he's such a big guy, uh, when he's holding different things, it looks kind of funny. So here's a picture of Shaquille O'Neal with a basketball. That is a regulation-sized basketball. So if you're familiar with holding a basketball, you can just see how small. It looks like a toy when Shaquille O'Neal is holding it. Here's a, another funny picture of him with a water bottle. If you've ever had a water bottle, you realize that compared with Shaquille O'Neal, looks pretty small. My favorite picture of all is him holding a drumstick. Yes, that is a normal chicken drumstick. Compared to Shaquille O'Neal, that looks very small. (laughs) 
And so the point that I'm getting at, I don't want to just show you pictures of Shaquille O'Neal. The point I'm getting at is that when we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer, and we give Him our problems, and we put them in His hands, our problems look so small. Because our God is so big. I can put even the war that is going on over in the Middle East, and I put them in God's hands, and you know what? It seems so small. But when I hold that, it overwhelms me. So the point is, give those anxieties to God. And we will be blessed because of it. And so let's think about when we go to God in prayer. Because remember that when we go to Him in prayer, we're to ask Him to bring our cares to Him. But do you notice two words in verse number 7? It said, with thanksgiving. So let's consider why we need to go to God in prayer with also with thanksgiving. So answer this. What is one thing that all Christians can be thankful for, regardless of how bad your life may be going? What is one thing that you can always go to God in prayer and thank Him for? Jesus Christ. When I think about how thankful I am to God for Jesus Christ, What does that represent? I think there's one verse that really hits the nail on the head. Go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. Paul writes to the Roman brethren, he says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not, with him, also freely give us all things? The fact that God gave us the best. He gave us his precious son. That is all the evidence you and I need to go to Him in confidence, knowing that what I need, He will give, because He's already given me the best. Why would He withhold anything else that I need when I present my anxieties and cares to Him? He's given us the evidence that He needs, that we need. And if He's given us the best, can we not give us of the things that we need? There's also an argument that Christ gives from the, the lesser to the greater. I love these verses. It comes from Matthew 10, verses 29 to 31. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. So God knows about the two sparrows that have fallen. He says, Do not fear, therefore, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Uh, I was talking to Todd. I know that there's a lot of people in here who probably raised chickens. Are birds the, the brightest of creatures? Like, do they, do they really have the, the most intelligence, the most brain? And there's a reason why we have the phrase bird brain, right? There's this kind of this pointing to the fact that, you know, birds are not the, the most wisest of animals. But God loves and cares for even the birds. How much more me, who is made in the image of God, and whom he gave his son to? All this evidence is what we bring before God in prayer. And when we put our anxieties in his hands, we should know that he cares for us. And so I want to make a little bit of a, an application off of these concepts that we've considered so far. I should be thankful to God, not only for Christ in my prayers, but I also need to remember the little things. And I appreciate something that Kim said in his prayer. I think he mentioned even like the heat, the warmness of the building. A lot of us can take that for granted. But even something little like that is provided to us from God. We can have the spiritual discipline in our prayers to not only be thankful for Christ, but to thank God for all of the little things in life. Because He's given us all of those things. And I'll, I'll make more of a point in just a moment. Here are some of the things that we may take for granted every day, but we need to thank God on a regular basis. Not for God's benefit, but for mine. The first we should thank Him for is our intellect. The abilities and talents that we have and use on a daily basis to be able to provide for ourselves and our families. That originates from God. But how often do you thank God in prayer for those things? Next is our strength. The very physical vitality that I have to go throughout my day and to take care of the things I need to take care of, that strength is provided to me from God because ultimately, of course, He created me. And so I should thank Him for it. The clothes and the shelter and the food that we have, all of those things come to us from God. And so why should we be thankful for the little things? Here's the main point. As, as Christ said in the, the model prayer, he said, give us this day our daily bread. Even Christ was aware and thankful of the things that, that God had given to him. But here's, here's the point. If we are thankful for the little things, we will 
strengthen our faith with these big trials. Sometimes we take for granted the day-to-day small things. And then when we get into the big trials, we think, where is God? How is he going to take care of me? But you don't realize he's been taking care of you every day of your life leading up to that trial. He's not going to abandon you in the midst of that big trial. So we should be practicing being thankful to him for the little things. So don't be anxious, but rather pray. Let your needs be made known to God with thanksgiving. And then, when we don't do that, and then we do that, God will do this. Verse number 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace that God offers is not the peace that the world offers. And Christ said as much in John chapter 14, verse 27, in the first part. He says, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. And when I read this first, I always thought it just meant the giving of peace. You know, the world gives the peace, but then takes it back, and it, it can't be reliable. But not only is it talking about the mode of giving, it's also talking about the manner of giving. The peace that God offers is not a tangible, it's not made up of the things of this world in such a way that the world looks at it and says, the Christian's peace makes sense. So let's delve into that a little bit more. If the world were to look at Paul, what would they see? Would they look at Paul and say, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense why you wouldn't have any anxiety. It makes sense why you'd be at peace. No. Consider some of the things that Paul had gone through. And I've kind of combined these into, into one kind of thought. So the world may look at Paul and say, you're in prison. Why in the world are you at peace? Why are you not anxious and worried. You're in prison. Not only are you in prison, you're all alone. None of your friends are here. None of your family. The church that you speak of, they're not with you. You're stuck in a cell. Why are you at peace? Not only that, you have problems with your health. This is an opinion. I do believe that Paul probably had problems with his eyesight. Or at the very least, he had problems with his health, probably. So they look at him and say, why are you at peace? You don't even have good health. You're in prison. None of your people are here. You have terrible health. Not only that, you don't even have a coat for winter. You remember, he asked Timothy to bring him a coat before winter, right? He didn't have much, but he had peace. Why, Paul? Why in the world did you have peace? Paul said to all of those things, really no big deal. I don't speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. We talked about these verses in Bible class this morning. His viewpoint was that if I don't have these things, God doesn't think that I need them. And you know what? I'm going to keep keeping the main thing the main thing, because that's all that matters. So how in the world are you at, so at peace and not anxious, even though you might be willing or ready to die? And so Paul says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And this is the core idea of the sermon. The Christian you and I have peace in God because of what Christ has done for us. And there's nothing in this world that can take that. There's no war in the Middle East that can change what Christ has done for us. There's no gunman in Maine or even in Iowa who can take away what Christ has done for us. There's no uh, election result in 2024 that's going to change what Christ has done for us. There's no food shortage. Even if we suffer and die, None of that can take away what Christ has done for us. And shame on me as a Christian if I let any of those things rob my joy and what my Christ, what my Savior has done for me. That is the point that Paul is trying to drive home. I was thinking of an illustration about sort of the peace that a Christian can have. I thought of a hurricane. And so when I looked at the details of a hurricane, I think it's uh, hurricanes can have at least I think a, a speed of like 74 mile per hour winds, which you guys in Iowa probably look at 74 mile per hour winds and think like, oh, that's really that's nothing. But it's, it's that way or higher, so it can get some pretty crazy winds. So in a hurricane, you have all the thunder and lightning and the wind and a lot of problems that it can cause. But there's something very unique about a hurricane. In the very center of a hurricane, called the eye, it's absolutely calm. All around it, there's all these storms and all these problems. That is the illustration of a Christian. You 
can have all these problems going on in your life, but when Christ is at the center of your life, you can have calm. It doesn't take you out of the storm, but you can have that, that calm if, if Christ is the center of your life. And so is He the center of your life? I'm going to give last, one last point of, of application. If you're taking notes, then you can write down um, these scriptures. If we need to increase our faith in God, and if God has given us all the evidence we need to trust in Him in all things, if you need to build your faith, here are some key passages for you to write down and to meditate upon each day. The first talks about God's care for His creation, and that should give me peace. Romans 8 talks about His love for us and how nothing can separate us from His love that He has given to us through Christ Jesus. The next, in Matthew 10, talks about how we should not fear men, because really, what can men do to us? There's no reason why we should have any anxiety. And Philippians 4 talks about the pursuit of peace. Not only the two verses we've considered this morning, but also, what do I need to do with my thoughts? What do I need to focus upon every day to not rob myself of the joy and peace I should have in Christ? So if you're struggling with your with this peace because your faith may be shaky, read these verses each day, meditate upon it, and pray to God, and ask Him to increase your faith so that you can have the confidence that He would have you to have in Him. And so if you are a Christian and you are anxious and worried, please pray. Please give it all up to God. And we, as your brothers and sisters in Christ, want to help you and want to pray with you and for you. And so if we can do that, please let that need be made known. The apostles were in a great storm, and Christ was actually in the boat is asleep. And they woke him up and said, we're perishing. And then Christ got up and said, peace be still. He calmed the waves. A lot of us who are Christians have Christ in our boat with us, and we need to ask him for help. Because we think when it's all on us that we're perishing. But he can calm the storms. If you are not a Christian and you do not have Christ in your boat to help you through the storms of life, then please become a Christian this morning. It's very simple on how to do that. You have to hear the Word of God. Romans, uh, I was blanking on the verse. Hear the Word of God and believe it. Then repent of your sins, Acts 2.38. And then we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is the Son of God who came to earth. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then will you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? 1 Peter 3 and 21. If you have any need, now is the time of God's invitation is extended to us. Let it be made known as together we stand and together we sing. Amen.